uh, thing, which is going to be the talk that we are going to give with you, um, for you, with Eric Wild. And I would want to invite Eric to the stage. Hi, Eric. And let me just sort out my slide situation here first so that I'm going to be ready to start doing some maniac things with you. <laughs> okay. And, <laughs> yeah, I, I can assure the audience that if you guys are going to learn anything from this talk, um, or if you guys think that we have rehearsed this talk, then yeah, maybe, maybe you will learn something and maybe we have rehearsed something, but we are probably not making any kind of promises. So, well, we do have a plan. Yeah, we have a plan. Yes, we have a plan to have a plan at least. So, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> but hey, with that plan, I know that one thing about that plan was to explain everybody what an API is. And for that, I have some props here. So, um, yeah, I have this, uh, you know. Yeah, my virtual camera is screwing up things. But yeah, I have this and you have that. Hey, I have bigger. I have the Bavarian one. This is the Swiss in, one. It's a uh, wind, wind yes. glass. Yeah, in Finland, in Finland, this would be like um, I don't know, a swimming pool for beer, because we usually have <laughs> just so small ones. But uh, why do we have these again? Can you please explain? Like this has something to do with API. No, it mostly has to do with beer. Uh, no, it okay. has something okay. to do with I, I got confused. I, I thought that it was B API and you were talking about like IPA or something. No, it actually is API. So I just yeah. wanted, so, so we wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, what like what APIs are and also what they are not. And sometimes we people have these kind of, I would say, slightly overblown expectations that APIs are going to fix everything. And sometimes it, it feels, at least to me, like a big part of my job is to explain to people that, no, this is not going to happen. Um, and one way I start doing that is explaining APIs with beer, since I'm German. So that's a good way to do it, I think. And the point I'm making there is like in the olden times, right, when you wanted to have a beer, you had basically you had to go to the pub and, you know, you maybe take your glass along and then you get the beer. So that worked fine, right? But it made the distribution of the beer relatively limited. You still enjoyed the beer, but it was kind of hard to get to, so to speak, right? And what we have nowadays is this, right? So mm -hmm. we deliver beer in much more convenient ways. I can take it home. Maybe there's advantages to this and that, whatever, but there's different delivery mechanisms of how I can consume beer more conveniently and how I can build new value chains by sending my beer to a supermarket and then the supermarket will sell it to consumers. And the way I kind of explain APIs is saying APIs are just the bottle or the can or the tap in the, in the pub, right? The API is the delivery mechanism. Your product, what you really try to sell or what people want to get access to, that's not the API, right? That's the beer. And the beer was always there, and you need to have good beer, or people won't care about eating it in a bottle or a can or whatever if it's not good beer. So the point there is that, yes, distribution and access is really important. So if nowadays you don't put beer in a bottle, you probably have a hard time growing. I mean, there are lots of microbreweries, right? But that's a different model. So if you want to grow, you probably need to think about how do I get my beer to people in a scalable way. But you still need to have good beer or very cheap beer or whatever, like some unique value proposition where people say, I want to have that beer, I want to find it in the supermarket, and then I'm happy. So that's that's my beer story. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I'm so glad that you mentioned the value proposition there because that is also something that gets people really confused because they might have like hundreds of APIs there. And like it's kind of like, I went to this German bar once because my team said to me that I have to bring them some uh, beer that was like, you know, artisan beer or something that, you know, special. And I I asked them, like, okay, how, how, am I, how am I supposed to ask a 
for that beer you know where where should i go and how should i ask and they told me that you have to tell them that it's like hungemacht <laughs> beer and i was like <laughs> okay <laughs> which by the way confused a lot of Germans that time. But anyway, uh, the idea was that there was this range of beers in the, the bar because I couldn't get it from any store like I would in Finland. But anyway, there's this bar with lots of different beers and from different you know ages and breweries and everything. And if I had to uh, figure out the value prop of each of those beers <laughs> to make it somehow clearer, I can see how that would confuse uh, uh, the barman unless they are very experienced. And I think that that's where we are with some of the cases of, of uh, API architects and product platform product owners and everybody because they have all that variety of beers <laughs> or APIs in this case. I just thought of another beer story, um, which is yeah. Pliny. Elder. So I don't know whether anybody knows Pliny the Elder. If you know Pliny the Elder, please leave a comment. Um, I'd, I'd like to hear that. I'll monitor the little chat there. Um, so Pliny the Elder is um, America's best IPA. At least it was. Like they they have like competitions every year. So and it's 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 made in a small brewery in the Russian River Valley in California. And when I lived in California. It, it was actually really hard to get because everybody wants to get it. So you had to go there, stand in line, actually show up with not a glass, but a growler, mm -hmm. these kind of go bottles. And people would do that, right? And, and again, right, if you, if you think of that, right, that's exactly like the product, the beer is so good that people don't care that access is really hard because they say, I want this beer, no matter what it takes, right? So in that case, you could say the delivery mechanism actually doesn't matter that much because the product is yeah. so good that everybody says, I don't care what it takes, I want the product, right? But in most cases, that's not the position you're in. Like in most cases, there's competition and you also have to think about how do I improve my delivery so that kind of the, the combo of delivery and product is kind of a, a good match, so to speak. Right. But, exactly. Um, yeah, I just thought about this, like another little beer thingy in there. It's always yeah. Good. So there, there seems to be a lot of like uh, these combinations of API and beer. So yeah, um, this is why everybody has beer in the meetups uh, around APIs. It seems, except of, of course now when we are all online. But no worries. Uh, we'll start going uh, with the API. Mania, like deep down, like this beer thing was just the first uh, kind of warm up act here. So, uh, Ivan is our track manager, seems to have gone for a beer because I'm trying to get him <laughs> the slides up. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ivan. I know that you guys in the team were starting to get your uh, throats thirsty when we were warming up this thing about beers uh, before we started, but let's let's live with it. So it's API mania time and my name is Marit Panina. I'm here with Eric Wild and we both can be found also in YouTube, not talking mostly about beer, but about APIs or something around that. So Eric is as himself in YouTube. I am mostly under Osango Academy. Um, and you can find us in Twitter uh, at Dread and at Mninioja. And of course, you can tweet your heart out of this conference and this talk uh, with hashtag API Days. And there are a few others there in Twitter when you start looking at that hashtag. So without further ado, uh, let's move on. So uh, here we have this weirdo walking and he's bringing pizza and why am i showing you this because uh one difficult situation where i've had to explain about apis to somebody was my three-year-old son and he wanted to get some pizza i was feeling like a bad working mom or something and and we got some pizza from the online uh delivery and and he was at this age where he was asking all the time why and why and how and you know mommy tell me explain and i made the mistake that he, he was asking that why did the 
pizza delivery guy bring the pizza to the door and I didn't give any money to him. So obviously he was confused because he thought that the pizza was free and uh, he thought that, hey, this is great because now we can get so much pizza all the time because it's free. And then I, for some weird reason, I felt that I have to start explaining myself and, and explaining the ins and outs of it. And so I said that, well, actually, mommy paid online. Uh, when I ordered the, the pizza, I paid in the online store and there was this, you know, payment thing with the banks involved and everything. Oh, no, that was the mistake. So he started asking, you know, well, how did the money go from the pizza guy? Well, my bank account to the pizza guy and from the uh, everything. And, and then I kind of got into this confusion where I explained to my three year old how PSD2 open banking and payment gateways work pretty much. Uh, you can you can figure out how that went. <laughs> but I have a very educated uh, son now. He's he's slightly older but anyway so that brings me to the question of of pizza and api so let's go to the subject of monetization so i mean what we all get asked i think uh eric you get asked this too and i have done workshops around this stuff but we always get asked about should I and how should I monetize the APIs? What are the different revenue models and everything? So um, we've heard this reverse monetization yesterday and selling your APIs on Marketplace. But if you had an API for ordering pizza, would you charge for it? Like honest answer, would you or would you not charge for it? That's a very good question. And I think in the end, right, that you really have to ask yourself, what's your value proposition, right? So um, I, could, I could think that I would charge if I had certain models behind it, right? And in most cases, you don't want to, right? Because you want people to order pizza. So it's kind of that will increase the number of pizzas you can sell, hopefully. So in the end, you, make, you want to make it easy for people to order pizza. And that's exactly uh, just a little plug, right? My, my latest video in my YouTube channel is about eBay, right? And they have kind of this thing, right? Where they have an API where you can buy eBay stuff and they make literally billions of dollars through it. And they, of course, don't charge for this API because it, it moves so much value for them, right? Mm. But I can imagine if I had a different model and let's say I would say my service is depending on the pizza you order, I will always order it from those pizza plates in town that makes the best this type of pizza right so if you order a margarita it'll be from one pizzeria if it's from if you want another pizza it'll be from a different i, I will just bring you the best type of pizza that you can possibly get mm. if that's my value proposition right it's like i'm the pizza expert and i make sure that i manage the different pizzas that are available then i would charge for it and i hopefully could make a living and if not then i probably would need to find something else to make a living with but it's really a question like how do i generate value that really is the question. And in most cases, and, and you said that, Mariuga, right? In most cases, when you talk to companies, the value is not in charging exactly for the API. The value is somewhere behind in the value chain, in the beer, right? So that's the important part. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of times APIs are a way to just keep your customers happy, uh, kind of with you longer or or, or make things faster for them or, or anything that kind of is related to your core product and service. And I think that that's something that companies are kind of missing out. Obviously, if you are charging a body up API or if you are having costs related to uh, providing the API, you have to cover them with something, but it might not be direct revenue from the API. And that's something that, I think sometimes confuses people. Uh, and you when, when you can open. I mean, you can, you can also get access to a whole new set of customers, right? So in eBay's yeah. case, for example, right? It's like they have an API. So what what happens there is that a lot of um, companies are actually offering kind of eBay products in their experience, right? Where and and that means that now you have people selling ebay uh, buying ebay things not on ebay but in other places which is yeah. great for ebay 
right? So in that case, now they have access to more customers and they have access because they made it possible for others to build experiences based on those APIs that they provide, right? And that is what is really valuable. Yeah, and, and, and I think that from there it can kind of uh, transform, like you can actually start offering the data related to those transactions, like like what are the different uh, favorite pizza tastes or, or uh, flavors that uh, people want to uh, consume or, or you can, you know, start doing some algorithms on the data and you can serve all those with API, but that kind of start, can come after you have done something more. And we, we, we actually uh, studied that when, when creating the book API Economy 101, because there, there were these researches about resources that companies have uh, around APIs and that can be exposed even without APIs or used by companies. Um, and there were, I don't know, about 50 re types of resources that companies may, might have. And actually all of those resources from like trademarks to uh, kind of cognitive resources, those, those can all be exposed via APIs. And I think that monetization <laughs> there is, is very much dependent on what are those resources and what is the value and, and what are the users using. And by the way, if we had such an API that would tell people's favorite flavors of pizzas, we, it would say that fin Finnish people are really strange because we even have reindeer pizza. So yeah, I, I, I bet you that there would be very interesting kind of use cases <laughs> for that kind of API. <laughs> Yeah, so you would you'll probably use this this data with a little bit of localization bias. Yes, right? exactly. <laughs> that should definitely be localized because I'm sure that not everybody would want you know either crickets or reindeer or something interesting. Crickets, oh, that's nice yes, too. Yes, crickets, crickets, crickets can be used in pizza too. I've told, I've been told, yes. But hey, so okay, so we've covered this monetization mania. So so people want to monetize APIs, not sure quite how. I want to, by the way, get rid of this and go to the monolith question. So we have this monolith question. So I mean, yes, there are monoliths in, in U Utah or there was, I don't know where it is now. It's just a couple of days. Yeah. Uh, but we also, did you know that we also had monoliths in Savonlinna, Finland? So, yeah, uh, I, I'm That's also sure a that... very pretty one. Yeah, isn't it? And it was like in a nice uh, environment and so. So uh, Savonlinna is, by the way, very popular about their, their opera festivals, usually not, of course, nowadays, <laughs> right now. But uh, so we all have these monoliths uh, tucked up somewhere in our uh, countryside or in our organizations. And now we've heard quite a lot of talks, uh, even in this API days about breaking up the monoliths and, and doing various things about the monoliths. And I think this is one of those questions that gets asked to a lot of times, what should you do with your monolith? What is that, Eric, what should we do? What should we do? Uh... Well, with this kind of monolith, I think we should just be happy when it's around because yeah. they tend to disappear. Did but, this thing disappear as well? Oh, yeah, sorry. But if you have this kind of monolith, like like some stone walls or, you know, should yeah, we yeah. put some icing on the cake and, and cover it, the monolith, the legacy system up with some nice icing and APIs or should we just, you know, break it up? What What should we do? I, whenever, this is another classic, right? And I'm sure people, tell you this or you know uh, speak about this question with you all the time as well it's like you know how do we do modernization and what do we do with the monolith and my, my usual response to that is to ask them like what's wrong with your monolith right why are you even trying to do that because in the end i think if you just look at modernization as i don't know like we don't have anything better to do um that that's not a good motivation it also makes it really hard to measure have you improved things and to figure out what should i invest in Right. So to some extent, if you look at monolithic cases, right, sometimes there may be problems, but I think it's also it's it's important to first really think hard about which problems you have and, and how you want them to be improved. 
And then there's two different aspects, right? So the icing on the cake part, I think this is often where you have the impression that you don't get enough access to stuff that's inside the monolith. So in that case, I think often it's kind of good enough if, if that works for you to like the icing on the cake, right? To have APIs around it, so to speak, that give you access to what the monolith provides. That's if that's the problem yeah, that you want to solve. Pretty. It's kind of like making it pretty and modern and, you know, have some nice, nice APIs and microservices on top of the existing one. And, and then all the cool digital service developers are also happy because they don't have to, you know, use the soap or some other <laughs> Older if your things. delivery mechanism is good enough, right, they'll be happy. Yeah. Um, but the point, and so for a while, I, I gave up on this one, right? But for a while, <laughs> I fought the battle to tell people there is no such thing as a microservices API because I always tried to tell people an API yeah. is an API and you have no idea yeah. where, where it runs, so to speak, who provides the API, and you shouldn't. That's the idea behind APIs, right? So, so if the icing on the cake is working and people say that's, good enough, I think that's fine, right? You can end it there and say, okay, we API enabled some of the stuff that we want to do. And that's, our problem is solved. The, the harder part is, right, when people say our, our actual problem is that we can't change things quick enough, right? If we want to make changes to what we do inside of the monolith, it always turns into this one year, two year project because this thing is so hard to change. And the, the whole, um, process of delivering a new version is so hard that it grinds us to a halt. That's a different story, right? Because now you really have to think about how do you kind of disentangle all these things that are inside of the monolith so that you can change these individually individual parts more quickly. And then you're in that uncomfortable place where you have to think about how do I, how do I uh, modularize my my monolith, and that that's that's hard, and that's that's typically I think also where, in another case, right as we discussed, in another case, like people have this idea that well, just throwing throwing APIs somewhere in there will solve this problem, but of course it doesn't, right? The, the hard work is the modularization. You will end up with APIs in the end, but <laughs> that's the easy part, right? The hard yeah. part is actually identifying the parts that then will be communicating through APIs. I, I had some uh, hard times finding a suitable picture to kind of uh, uh, represent the, the way that I felt about it. But like we talked uh, when we were preparing this, um, then there is this kind of idea that you have this legacy platform, for example, and, and you, you can't maybe break it up. It might not be totally feasible, but then you need some additional features. It's kind of like I, I took this from the Turku Castle in Finland, this picture here. And, and, you know, it's kind of like, you know, how they built these medieval castles. So you have this kind of first castle, the very small one, and, and, and you know, it's pretty uh, brute force, just some some um, things there and basic living for the knights or something or the soldiers. And then you start, you know, getting more and more people there. You need to start building more and more annexes and, and, and things there. And, and it kind of starts growing, but you don't take away the old one. It's still in the middle there somewhere and you kind of add to it. <laughs> And that was kind of my analogy of like how Turku Castle and API. Like this, uh, you know, it's not, it's, I love that you picked the castle. I have the exact, like, I have a presentation about monoliths, right? Where actually, as the monolith, I also use a castle, of course, a German castle, well, um, of course, yes. but a castle, uh, right? Which is like this highly optimized integrated thing to do one thing, right? To basically oh. be there for a couple hundred years and just, you know, like do its thing. And then my my other picture is actually just a market, right? A farmer's market, which is oh. much more nimble. Like you have whenever something is in season or somebody wants something, you have people who will offer it hopefully, right? And there also will be people who don't offer their stuff anymore because nobody wanted it. So they just disappear from the market, right? So the market is a much more flexible yeah. way of how you can make sure that like value gets created. It has some other disadvantages, 
right? Yeah. But it's I, it's just a very different model. I have the. Uh, I'm trying to move over from the camera, but I have the uh, market, the center, <laughs> central market square from Helsinki behind me, just for that nice. reason. <laughs> but hey, uh, so now that we have like we've been uh, building up the mania here, and we have some heavy stuff coming up, so I just wanted to have this. Uh, small break. So for the audience and for you, Eric, this is a spelling test. I will give you a word and I want you to spell it out. But please give a, a moment for our audience to kind of figure this out too. So this is a really difficult word. Are you are you ready? Yeah. So yeah. swagger, swagger. How do you spell swagger? Okay. I promise the audience this is more difficult than it might seem. But if you are with me, just put your guesses on the chat. And Eric, you will have a moment to think about this. OK, it's I'm really thinking difficult. hard. I'm thinking really hard, yes. Yeah, yeah. OK, how do you? Should I go? Yeah, Mats, Mats already, and, and Eliel, they oh, 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 I'm not uh, telling you what they're answering. Let's see. So, Eric, how would you spell this? Okay, uh, O P E N A P I. Oh, yes. And now we can expose uh, the right answer. And if you got this right, you are as good as Eric. Swagger is spelled open API. Okay, we'll leave you with that. Think hard. Why is this the right answer? And moving on to the integration, which is a pretty dirty word. We collected a few dirty words in the end. Um, so uh, I just collected here all those ways of talking about integration around APIs that confuse people a lot. So there's like continuous integration, not to do with integrating with APIs, to do with API development, yes. Then there's this crazy dude with like quick integration, is that something weird, and data integration. But then we are getting close to this uh, with this, we heard you like connector stuff here. But what is your take on this? I mean, we all get these questions about APIs and integrations and talking about these things as if they were one thing. Eric, what is your yeah. take? <laughs> yeah, it, 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 for me, it's like a trigger word. Um, I, I, have, I have always discussions with our uh, product people, right? So I work for Xway and, and we, we do software, we create software in the API space. And of course, we talk about integration because you just kind of need to use that word because it's a word that people have used a lot. Personally, I always try to not use it because I think it has a lot of baggage to it. It has a lot of this idea behind it that integration is something that you do to two things, right? You have you take two things and then you integrate them and that's kind of a thing that you do and then there's an integration thingy that is somewhere. And that has led us to all the kind of bad patterns that, that are these highly integrated places that are hard to change, that build up these these levels of complexity over time, like you showed in the castle, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that the important shift in mindset in APIs is really that there is, there, so to speak, is no integration. There is a provider, there is a consumer, and, and the idea is that these two are loosely coupled. And when the provider has a service that the consumer chooses to use, the consumer just does it. Uh, and that's basically what kind of the integration looks like. I know that there are, you know, you could argue around like certain patterns and tooling and, and so forth. But I just think there's so much baggage and, and like bad practices around the, the integration term that personally I try, I try to avoid using it as much as I can. Yeah, it's, it's you always should uh, check what people are meaning when they are talking about integration because it's a pretty loaded word and based on the person's background there's a lot of confusion there so there's the hardcore integrators who use the integrator platforms and they have a certain idea in their head what an integration looks like and means and then there's the devops guys who 
you know, immediately think about CI pipelines and continuous integration. And then there, there, there are other guys who don't even know they're integrating when they're actually integrating. <laughs> when, uh, I mean, the, the, this is getting really complex. And, and I've noticed that, you know, people who are not so in to the subject are making a lot of uh, confusions with the terms. But last thing, oh, yes, uh, last thing. So uh, should we ask API management from Santa? So everybody wants API management. One simple answer, what should we tell them? What, the, what are they kidding from the package when they ask for API management? They just get, get a lot of things in there that they can't, could or could not do, right? So APIs mm -hmm. really are just a very technical thing. And I think the important thing is really to always think about what do you want as a gift, so to speak, right? What 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 is the problem that you're facing, and why do you think that um, APIs or API management should be in your package, right? And then mm -hmm. I think it's a, that's a much better starting point to have a conversation around. Okay, now what else do we need, right? Because yeah. just APIs alone or APIs management alone won't just fix magic magically fix problems yeah and is it a process or is it a tool and and what if you are kind of in this centralized or decentralized uh place and 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 uh well be it api management COVID, or or something else how do you use centralization and decentralization to solve it but hey now we are uh ending with our session time so thank you eric and be sure to go and check out eric's uh youtube channel have some beer uh and then also if you want to learn more about api monetization or any of the subjects there's a lot of stuff in the osango academy